Okay, so um, it's nine o'clock. So hello everyone, um, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to this time's new Zoom seminar. Um, so um, it's really my great pleasure to welcome today's uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Jing, uh, Jing Yuan Fu from uh, Netherlands. So I think a lot of us probably already knows uh, Jing's work uh, from her really remarkable record of uh, microbiome and genetic work. Um, a very, very brief introduction about Jing. Um, so Jing Yuan is currently a full professor of system medicine in uh, Universal Medical Center uh, Groningen in Netherlands, uh, with a particular focus on inter integrative uh, genomics and a host of microbiome uh, interaction in complex diseases. So uh, Jing obtained uh, <clears throat> her undergraduate uh, education in biochemistry in Nanjing University. Uh, and then she uh, moved to Netherlands to continue her uh, master's study in biotechnology and the bioinformatics. And then further, uh, she um, pursued her PhD uh, in system genetics, uh, uh, also in Netherlands. So through this uh, route, through this route, she developed her research line on systems genetics in complex traits and became a expert in uh, integrative uh, genomics and system biology. So her lab is mainly interested in studying how to require a greater knowledge of uh, the human genome and the mic uh, gut microbiome interaction with each other and affect how they affect uh, human health uh, in order to create a better method uh, for disease prediction, uh, prevention, and treatment. Uh, in order to accomplish this, uh, her research combines with large-scale genetics and microbiome association studies in big groups of individuals uh, with functional study using advanced bacterial culturing and organ on chip technologies, which I think we're probably going to hear uh, a lot today. So uh, with uh, her really uh, quite um, amazing records of publication and then uh, academic achievements, she holds numerous uh, prestigious uh, personal grants and several uh, national and international consortium uh, uh, grants. She's a laureate of uh, Amendo Science Award in 2023, and uh, she's recognized as a highly cited research by uh, Web of Science. So I think uh, it's really, really our uh, pleasure to have Jings here to uh, tell us about her latest study. And then for that, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, Jing, please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you um, for Dr. Wu's uh, invitation. Also very nice uh, introduction. I'm very, it's my honor also to uh, here to share our research work on the gut microbiome and its role in human and immune response and inflammation, particularly, I think, the theme of this uh, forum. So um, before I start, I think first I would like to uh, introduce what exists human gut microbiome. It refers to the uh, collective community of the thousands, trillions of microorganisms that reside in, human, in humans' gut. So these uh, human gut microbiome actually contains 39 trillion bacteria cells, basically more like the same number of the human cells. So in terms of the number of cells, we can consider ourselves actually half human being, half bacteria. However, actually, and the gut microbiome also contains 22 million genes, which is a thousand more times genes than the human genome has. So therefore, you can imagine in the, in the terms of number of the genes, you probably most consider your deck like a bacteria than a human being. So that is also because of the important role of the gut microbiome uh, in human health and disease. The human gut microbiome also referred now as the second human genome. However, different from the, there's of course some differences from the human genome and the human gut microbiome. I often refer the human genome as a code book, which is written before you were born. And this book will be not changed during the whole course of your life, if we're to only talking about the German line variants. However, the gut microbiome can be seen as a library of thousands of different bacterial genomes. 
And this library was constructed largely after your birth and get matured at the age of your three, and also can undergo dynamic change during the course of your life. And the content of the library will be also dependent on the disease and the health, physiological status of its host. So uh, to really understand what type of library everybody has in their gut, what do they play a role in, uh, in the human health? Actually, we start asking ourselves this, those questions from um, back to probably 2012. Uh, which will we just first, very simple, just try to understand actually what exactly reside in our gut, how variable between individuals, which factors can shape our gut microbiome, what is impact on human health and disease. There's a deep, many different way to study, uh, to answer these questions. One way approach that we, are, uh, we took is actually large cohort study. One of the cohort we are often used is called lifelines. This is one of the largest uh, population-based prospective cohort in, in, in Europe, even worldwide. And this project started in 2006 and following 167,000 participants for 30 years. And covering basically covering 10% of the population in north three provinces of the Netherlands. Every one and a half year, each participant is going to receive all kinds of questionnaire about their health, lifestyle, medication, and living environment, economic status, and so on. Every five years, those participants went, go, went to clinical and center. Then we will also collect all different kinds of biological samples, including plasma, urine, feces, hair, and their DNA as well. So you can imagine it is a very large biobank and a data bank. Based on this cohort, we then both, uh, I, I have several add-on study, particularly focused on the gut microbiome. The first add-on study is called Lifelines Deep, which we have 1,500 individuals. Why is called deep? Because these participants, we have deep omics profiling. So everybody has been genotyped, methylation has been profiled using Illumina 450K, uh, RNA-seq data, proteomics data, all kinds of microbiome data, uh, metabolomics data, pro uh, also including microbiome as well. So this cohort started actually, the microbiome data started collected in, in the year of 2012 and 2013. The first paper published 2016. And then there will be also second round that we also followed up for like four years, five years later. And based on the success of the Lifelines Deep cohort, in the second time point, we also add a, a, a new add-on study called the Lifelines Dutch Microbiome Project, where we had 10,000 participants. We had systematically uh, collected uh, microbiome samples in their stool, but also in the oral and swab, uh, no swabs. And or uniquely, we also had live microbes collected from all three body sites for all participants. And of course, and, and now the um, follow up of, um, sampling also have been completed last year. As I just mentioned, the gut microbiome and, and its development of the microbiome is very important during early life. So then we also tried to add on um, the fourth generation in, the, in, the, in this study uh, by following the pregnant women and their newborns. In this case, we initiated a cohort called Lifelines Next with 1,500 uh, pregnant women and their newborn babies and followed many uh, multiple time points at the first year of life and hopefully will be continued a year, uh, for the yearly uh, connection. So this is a large cohort we have been set up for this analysis. And as I mentioned, one very particular unique feature of all our cohorts that we also generate a multiple omics data sets and a very extensive phenotype for different purpose. Then how we start gut microbiome? And not, uh, nowadays, there's two common approaches and for the microbiome profiling based on next generation sequencing. One approach, you can, only, you can sequence only one bacteria-specific genes, which is called 16S ribosome RNA gene. 
And of course, a lot of approach, you can do the whole genome, bacterial genome sequencing that is called a uh, shortcut meta, meta, uh, metagenomic sequencing. So actually, at, um, back to a few years ago, we did uh, uh, both techniques for the same set of the samples. You can find out actually only based on one gene, we're able to identify um, 260, the only 60 genes in humans got. And more or less the same in the number of the genes can be identified using the whole genome uh, shotgun sequence. However, if you go further, actually you recognize and further on the species level or even subspecies level, 16S will doesn't yield sufficient information to more on, on the taxonomic diversity and composition in the more higher resolution level. So afterwards, we only use the metagenomic sequencing and for functional readout for uh, more, more, could have a more deep understanding on the role of the cotton microbiome. And first, we have observed the microbiome composition, microbiome composition is very different between different individuals. So, and each bar indicate one, one individual, and the length of the bar indicated the abundance of certain taxa. The upper part, for instance, showing the abundance of a phylum level, you can see that two major phylums in, in, in individuals got, human gut, one is called Formicules, another one and is Bacteroides. And somebody has a very high abundant Bacteroides and somebody even has only, when they only have Formicules in their gut. If you zoom, go to the lower levels, for instance, look at the family levels, same in the thing. At least you see very diverse uh, composition in different individuals. And of course, as mentioned, the microbiome composition can change over time. So we also assess the, the differences, for instance, between four years apart by following uh, in, uh, 340 individuals. And the upper part is the um, baseline composition, and the lower panel is showing its composition in the, in the four years later. You can see that indeed some variation level. We do not only look at the composition, abundance of the species, but we also look at the genetic makeup of, the, of those species. For instance, the orange dot refers to the um, genetic differences between two time points for each species. And, uh, and then the green dot does refer to the genetic differences between two unrelated samples, two individuals, basically. You can also see actually the genetic list and also that the variation also significantly smaller than the differences between different individuals. Based on this, we can conclude definitely gut microbiome will change over time, but its change is also definitely significantly smaller than the, change, than the differences between uh, with other people. So therefore everybody actually maintain their very unique features, unique composition. So based on that, we can even build a machine learning model to, to identify microbial fingerprint. Based on those models, we can actually have the very accuracy to predict its host. For instance, with a uh, reference D participant that we collect four year apart, the AEUC, you can be 95%, refers to 99% sensitivity and uh, specificity and 85% sensitivity. And we also apply the same, uh, same model to the human microbiome and, and uh, samples collected uh, one year apart in the human microbiome project, actually uh, in, in NIH. We found, that, of course, you can imagine the shorter duration is accuracy is higher, was indeed the case that we could even have a higher prediction on its host. So based on now, I can see people could be convinced Everyone has very unique gut microbiome uh, composition and uh, genetic makeup, actually just like our human genetics. So this also indicate gut microbiome will be an important player in personalized medicine. Of course, which factors actually determine its individual specificity? So then we actually we performed analysis to look at whether it could be due to gen host genetics or could it be due to the environment uh, factors. 
So for, and because our cohort is family based, the first thing we can also assess, for instance, compare the microbiome, and here is dissimilarity distance between two un unrelated individuals. Then that means they do not share genetics and also they do not share environment. But compared to the unrelated individuals, partners who live in the same household, that means they share environment but do, do not share genetics. They are um, microbial distance is smaller, means higher similarity. And then further, you can find uh, the distance between parents and the child and or between um, brother and sister siblings was even getting smaller. So this indicating if you had shared genetics, shared environmental factors, you're more tend to have a higher uh, similarity in your micro gut microbiome, indicating the gut microbiome can be determined by both host genetics and environment, probably there are also their interactions. Before they can quantify how much variation in the gut microbiome could be explained by genetics, that was referred to the blue bar here, or based on environment factors, or by, uh, or by the uh, shared householding, because we may not uh, perfectly differentiate its genetics or environment. But still, you can see environment factors are significant uh, and dominant over than the effect of genetics, indicating that, um, the gut microbiome mainly dominantly driven by environmental factors. So as our cohort is a um, population-based cohort, so therefore we do not uh, pre-select the participant for any disease. The disease prevalence also reflect the prevalence of the general Dutch population, but also allowing us uh, to do analysis for different kinds of disease types. So then we performed all kinds of association with a different disease. And we found uh, gut microbiome associated with many different disorders, including cancer, cardiometabolic disorders, gastrointestinal disease, mental neurological disease, and also uh, skin, uh, other, other immune-related disorders. Actually, we had one simple question, just ask, how are you? Just simply ask a participant to feel in how, how do you feel today? To recall it, how are you index? Actually, this index we found actually perfectly reflect the participant's physiological and mental health. You can also find the species that we found associated with one disease and tend to be also associated with other disease and also in the same direction. So this, um, except of course for healthy, um, good health, and uh, how are you index? So this also indicate actually, uh, there seems to have a shared common microbiome signals in, uh, in different type of disease because we found and those shared sharedness of the microbiome signals could not be explained by the disease comorbidity. So you can see much stronger sharedness. If you look at the comorbidity, you can see it's actually not, not, so, not so many comorbidity in our population, in our cohort. So then actually provide evidence to support the, uh, the words of the Hippocrates, uh, uh, sorry. Hippocrates said 2000 years ago, all disease begin in the gut. So then we wonder how exactly gut microbiome contribute to human health. There's two root and often discussed. One is metabolism. Another one, of course, immune response, inflammation as well. So actually the later part is also the focus of my today. First thing, uh, we wonder whether gut microbiome can really influence, for instance, the capacity of an uh, individual's immune response. This is a project uh, we collaborated with uh, uh, Mihai Latier from the Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and also Ramlik uh, and uh, uh, Melani from the from Broad Institute. And we have 500 participants. We collected the uh, you know, whole blood or PBMCs and from those participants. And then in the in vitro, we stimulate the, and the blood cell immune cells with different uh, uh, pathogenic factors. For instance, LPS or um, pathogen bacteria or fungi. And then we measure the cytokine production upon stimuli. So this way we refer like a, a, a 
cytokine production capacity. So it's different, just a major cytokine levels in the blood samples. Actually, we also did it, but I didn't mention in this talk. So you can see uh, normally, uh, and this is the baseline. If you, without no stimuli, the cytokine levels will be very low. After different kind of uh, stimuli, you can see uh, uh, many cytokine production was increased. You're also able to see uh, the cytokine production actually could be, for instance, uh, stimuli specific. For instance, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, uh, Candida and uh, Python in stimuli, they will definitely greatly increase the uh, production of the NF alpha gamma and like um, also an IL-22, but not much induced the production of IL-6. And you, we also able to observe a large variation uh, between different individuals. Then you force, uh, similarly, you also, we are also able to see there's also big variation in the gut microbial composition of those participants. And we found those variation could explain up to 10% of the variation in the cytokine production capacity upon different stimuli. And then, as I said, you can actually, there's a different type of response we can observe. One response is that certain stimuli can always, you know, in, uh, in reduce some uh, production capacity, um, um, cytokine production, that we call it like a stimuli specific uh, uh, response. And also could be some association could be cytokine specific. That means always the same cytokine uh, response to the different stimulation associated with gut microbiome. Or could be the combination. The gut microbiome can only uh, you know, associate it with a, a certain cytokine production capacity upon a certain uh, stimuli. So I'll give you one example here. And we see, uh, is the copri copri comes the y axis refer its abundance in in the human's gut, and the y axis assess the different cytokine production. For instance, IL one beta um, production, and also an IL six production, all be, uh, all response to the um, candida in the stimuli. You can see they all positive associated. So this refers to actually is more stimuli uh, specific association, but the, however, you can also see IL-22 on the, on the other uh, stimuli uh, stu uh, response would be also different. Also, it's also associated, but they actually show very different from the IL-1 IL beta and IL-6. This study we did in health individuals. So you may wonder, uh, what is it to look like, for instance, in the people who had a certain disease, for instance, people living with HIV. You can imagine the people who actually live with HIV, their immune systems is already severe um, promised. So then we do find actually a dramatic difference in the gut microbiome as well. So compare the uh, uh, healthy individuals, the gut microbiome composition show a, a very big shift um, for the people you know, living with HIV. And we found that these differences, not only on the composition level, if we really zoom into bacteria, the gene contents of the different species, we're even able to find very completely different strains presented in healthy individuals and the people living in HIV. For this case, in the Prevotella corpore, which is a species already known to be involved in the immune response. And this is the people you, we, we Group the two health cohort and also people with HIV cohort, you can see this group of the individuals had a very uh, different gene content than the individuals uh, and uh, than this cluster. And this cluster clearly reached for the healthy individuals and these clusters are reached for the people living with HIV. So actually, we also find a significant difference uh, in, in, in related to immune regulation of those two uh, strains. For instance, we found only healthy related strains are associated with immune response. So the, the Bunan thought refers to the in a correlation that 
this uh, sorry i should have mentioned this is all only for the people living hiv i didn't include the results in uh, in this port for the health individual anymore so the background is the same everybody is the human and, and is a human living with hiv patients but some but most people had a uh, and how and uh, HIV specific strains, then these strains do not show any association with the cytokine production capacity. But the, some of these patients, the less, uh, as, um, had the healthy related uh, um, strains, and those strains do show very strong association with their cytokine production capacity. Similarly, we also found the healthy related strains in the, in the, um, in the HIV patients, they also show higher uh, positive correlation with CD4 plus C and T cells count and also CD4 plus T cell recovery after treatment. So then we was wondering in which way bacteria can um, trick our immune response uh, in um, so of course you may know that bacteria you know can uh, produce a lot of uh, antigens those antigens can actually activate human immune response for instance through the tor like receptors and of course but there's this, we still have knowledge about the different type of antigens still limited so how we're able to systematically assess which peptide from the gut microbiome actually can trigger immune response. Then we uh, performed uh, uh, methods called uh, FIPSIC analysis. This approach is first actually based on the, you know, the database, also based on uh, metagenomic sequencing. When we select the proteins, uh, secretory proteins or pathogenic proteins, uh, then we um, split those uh, genes, bacteria genes, to a peptide with 60 amino acids. Uh, then this peptide, this DNA is for this peptide will be cloned to the phages and then tra and, uh, translate, transcribed it actually, then express those uh, uh, peptides on the surface of those uh, phages. And then you can uh, um, incubate those phages library with the blood samples of the participants. If a certain anti an antibody can recognize these as an uh, antigens in the expressed in the phage surface, then you can actually capture them by the by the immune and the precipitations and further with the sequencing. So through the collaboration with uh, an Israel group led by Iran Sika, in his lab, they uh, constructed a three a library with uh, over 344,000 peptides uh, containing many bacteria uh, uh, genes, but also virulence of factors, uh, also some uh, uh, antibody coated proteins and uh, pathogenic strains, virums, and so on. So then we, we performed the FIPSIC analysis, for, for instance, for our lifeline deep participant, including both baselines and also four years afterwards for some of the individuals. So we found out of 344,000 bacteria peptides, we're able to detect it, uh, at the, an antibody against uh, over 50% of those peptides, at least in one sample. That means actually a lot of bacteria peptides can actually can trick our immune response. Of course, we also found that such immune response are very individual specific. So as you see here, if you look at any, most of the antibody, uh, most of the um, probably over um, a hundred, a hundred thousand of the antibodies, actually you're only able to find one or a few samples. So actually also indicating individuals antibody epitope reservoir also highly specific. However, we, for the commonly detected ones, we also found actually some of the antibody peptides actually show co-occurrence. By looking at co-occurrence also highlight actually a certain motives, which may drive the antibody and, and, and cross reactivity. So if you and different peptides are made from different bacteria, but they have shared the same motive, seems to be all recognized by same antibody. 
Based on this antibody and uh, epitope reservoir, we also associated with uh, different phenotypes. Uh, for instance, if you have a, whether you have a pet or not, whether you had a, a, some uh, exposure effect at infant time and health disease, immune markers, metabolic, also all kind of other, uh, uh, even in the cell counts of the blood cell counts and so on, and in smoking and many factors seems to be associated as well. So indicating is made also in, uh, important for human health. And I'll give you one example for, for its association we observed. For instance, IBD. IBD, there's a, a referred to inflammatory bowel disorder diseases. Actually, there's two forms. One is Crohn's diseases. One is called an, an arthritis colitis. And then we look and compare the antibody uh, reservoir and in the patients with IBD and compare them to the also healthy individuals. So here we look at only present absence, whether this antibody, if it's presented, uh, presented in the both uh, health individuals or the, or the patients, you were, they were all mainly landed in the diagonal. But if you had a higher uh, frequency observed in patients, you were, um, they will be more derived and significant. This was marked in um, red dot here. Very interesting, you may have noticed Actually, one group of red dots here seems that certain antibody uh, against, um, against bacterial peptide very striking and only observed in the Crohn's disease instead of in the um, colitis. So actually, we found those peptides actually all related to bacterial frangines. What are frangines? Frangines actually refer to the bacteria and uh, the, the, the proteins, the new structure actually from certain proteins uh, that like a, like a tear, you know, and for the bacteria actually help them to moving around. So actually um, frangenin and um, it's also, um, is can found to be also pathogenic because uh, our immune systems actually very small. They have a tor uh, our tor like receptors, uh, fact pathways are very small. They have a different lines of uh, way to recognize which one is a. Uh, uh, foreign cells, uh, not, uh, not human cells, which are uh, good for other uh, friends. So for instance, uh, for the, uh, uh, most of the pathogen bacteria are a gram negative of microbe. And they, if uh, some of the Tor-like receptors will recognize bacterial DNA, that is tor receptor 9. And then Tor receptor, uh, 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 Tor like receptor four, we are recognized LPS to produce by gut microbiome. Then Tor like receptor five, uh, we are recognized active frangini, whether the, uh, the cells had a certain tail or not. If they had tails, they can tell, okay, this is not human cells. So this is also to say the systems like look uh, like in such a way to recognize to trick immune systems to to find out which are human cells which are not human cells. Actually, a uh, previous a lot of study also found and uh, had the same observation in the IBD patients. They also found actually frangenin and, and uh, response and um, positively correlated with the very specific uh, and T uh, effective cells, uh, memory cells, uh, and particularly for CD4 plus, CD4, uh, CD154 plus cells. Instead, there's no frangenic response. It's not correlated, for instance, in T and central memory cells. It's a very specific uh, uh, T cell type, subtype. It's relevant also for the uh, frangenin and uh, re antibody response. Of course, bacteria not only always uh, have a harm effect to trigger immune response. Somehow, bacteria also can actually train our immune system in aiming to even suppress our immune system. For instance, and in a, pro a collaborative project with uh, Dr. Zhou from China, we identified uh, endopeptidase peptides in bacteria. And these peptides and proteins actually can help to generate lot like, uh, not to ligands, 
Therefore, active not to pathway. This pathway also important for pattern recognition uh, receptors to for immune response. Therefore, the lot two signaling pathway will play a very important role to also maintain intestine homeostasis. By comparing uh, the abundance of these genes in different cohort, including the human and uh, HP project in, in, the, in, the, in the US, and Spain cohort, China cohort, or Netherlands cohort, we all found actually these proteins uh, is decreased and in the patients with, uh, with IBD in the Crohn's disease. And we also found, I've certainly found actually those proteins actually can residue and uh, colitis protect against the colitis in mice via the lot two pathway. So um, first, of course, um, the upper part showing, for instance, here the ap apoptosis score. The higher score means the, the bite, the more dead cells. The lower score is better. So for the healthy controls, you can see the ap apoptosis score is very low. The second one actually we induced uh, 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 IBD in the mice model. You can see a very high uh, apoptosis score. Afterwards, we also gave these mice uh, for this uh, for this type that the product of these peptides, and then you can see the apoptosis actually is decreased. This means we actually secure uh, and, and the di prevent the disease for the progression and can be used as a, as a disease treatment. In line with that, we also find, for instance, the inflammation was also induced by adding those uh, bacteria and derived. Uh, and protein and its products. Of course, other way we also think uh, uh, bacteria's uh, impact on immune systems can be also not only used for other uh, disease treatment, for instance, immunotherapy. Immunotherapy become actually the very you know, more, more promising approach for the cancer treatment. And, uh, and checkpoint inhibitors basically inhibit the binding of the um, um, PDL1 ligands that and um, of the um, um, that which can bind the in T cells uh, um, PD1 to inhibit the activation of the T cells. That was uh, tumor cells will uh, and, and could actually escape the immune uh, reactions of the cells. Then immune and uh, checkpoint inhibitor try to block this uh, this uh, binding, therefore uh, allowing uh, a T cell to be activated, therefore can kill the cancer cells. Uh, a couple of years ago, it is already found because of the immune uh, only thirty percent of the people can really respond to immunotherapy, and people also found uh, the gut microbiome actually associated with uh, responder and non-responders. In responders, you can find actually the, the gut microbiome show higher diversity, higher proportion of the faecal bacteria, plasticity, and many beneficial bacteria, and the non-responders also showing non-favorable. Uh, composition. And the people also actually, and, and, and in the mouse experiment, people even said by just avoid antibiotic use uh, in the immunotherapy actually can boost the immune response and uh, the response rate by 30% and just by avoid antibiotic uses. And how it works? Actually, a lot of the recent study also found actually and, and bacteria, for instance, um, and, and and this bacteria, this species, actually they can also downrun because actually the bacteria not only had a to, uh, ligands one, but they also had a ligands two to inhibit the T cell uh, reaction. And they found bacteria actually can not, and, uh, talk like receptor many uh, affect them, uh, PDL1, but then bacteria also can downregulate the expression of PDL2 expression, therefore also promote anti tumor uh, immunity. Uh, even a lot of very exciting stories also come a lot of research group and visual, uh, micro facial bikes live, and then can even use bacteria 
engineer the bacteria and to, to, uh, to express uh, and, and cancer specific antigens, and therefore activate uh, in, 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 this, in the bacteria that are applied to the tumor cells, uh, particularly because here is a melanoma, they can just put on the skin, then you can activate T cells and to, to, and for the immune therapy. So you can even use engineered bacteria and to bring some, uh, you know, uh, uh, antigens uh, 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 to press specific antigen to activate the T cell uh, uh, activate activation, therefore stimuli and, and, and immune response. Of course, and bacteria do not affect uh, immune response only through the peptide, only through different antigens. Actually, bacteria can also influence our immune response during different uh, uh, metabolites they, they produce. For instance, one very known example is short-chain fatty acids. This actually uh, pro uh, fact, uh, products of bacteria fermentation of undigestible fiber by gut microbes. Short chain fatty acids, including acetate, protetate, and butyrate, particularly butyrate, have a, has been recognized to have a very important immune mutilation role in, in, in the human health. They can activate naive T cells to the T regulatory cells. They can also inhibit the production of uh, pro inflammatory and, and, and cytokines and so on. Another way also we can see, for instance, the vitamin production, particularly vitamin B and vitamin K, and they also, they can, human body cannot produce those vitamins. You can either gain it from your diet or you can, and uh, bacteria and can produce those vitamins uh, for you. So this picture showing the vitamin production capacity in human gut, basically they can totally collect, uh, collectively explain 7.5% uh, of the metabolic capacity of your gut microbes. And we also found actually bacteria vitamin production capacity also associated with different uh, host metabolic immune phenotypes, including, of course, for instance, the in inflammation markers like uh, um, HLP, um, um, I did this, um, somewhere there, yeah. Um, and so also other and, uh, lipid profiles and also um, and stool consistency and so on. Another group of metabolites also uh, very famous, known, very well known for the interaction of the host and the microbiome, it is a bioisis metabolism. Primary bioisis actually synthesized from uh, cholesterol metabolism in the liver, and then they will go to the intestine and converted by the by gut microbiome towards secondary bioisis, and then go back to the liver. So bioisis pool actually will um, complete this uh, liver gut uh, circulation eight, per, eight to 10 times per day. So they actually provide energy benefit to bacteria and not only regulate the bacterial population, uh, also help us, of course, to um, for the fat absorptions, but also more importantly, recently, the, the role of the bile acids in immune, immune response also emerging. They're showing to be active, activate the signaling pathway and also regulate the T cell homeostasis. For instance, by looking at the uh, scenarios got the microbiome, they found the very and uh, one novel, unique, and uh, special um, uh, bioisis called ISO LCA was significantly higher in the people and, and uh, with the uh, scenarios. And then you compare to older people or even their relatives, this is a much uh, significantly higher. And then we found, also found that by in vitro experiment, and these bacteria uh, bioassays actually have also showed the antibacterial activity. They actually they have uh, uh, can actually kill pathogens. Here is a very uh, important, very low uh, pathogenic bacteria. You can see with those back and uh, and L. LCA, ISO LCA, the, the, uh, the growth of the bacteria will, uh, pathogens will be inhibited. 
Of course, this is a few of the no examples, uh, but many, many uh, metabolites we still don't know what they can, uh, what will be role with that play and which uh, factors actually shape this uh, metabolism. So therefore, we also performed a large uh, scale systematic genetic gut microbiome diet association with the plasma metabolome. So we identified a group of metabolites either associated with diet or gut microbiome or human genetics. And we also found a large group of metabolites associated with both diet and gut microbiome really indicate the interactions. And also based on the effect, effect size of different factors, we can also characterize which group of metabolites probably dominantly driven by your diet or which group of factors uh, metabolites are driven by your gut microbiome or which actually driven by the pathway. Um, uh, the genetics. So you can also imagine there has a complex interactions also probably not only with our uh, metabolism, but also could be through our immunity because I showed metabolites also can contribute to our um, uh, immunity as well as diet. So therefore we also assess whether which diet actually can link to pre and anti-inflammatory features of the gut microbiome. I show you some of the examples, for instance, uh, Roseburia species of Fickley bacteria plus lisi, which are all the short chain fatty acids producers, which are beneficial bacteria and actually can help the home uh, immune uh, systems. And you find its abundance are positively associated with a higher intake of fish, vegetables, plant, and negatively associated with the uh, sugars and carbohydrates, sweets, and uh, non-healthy diet. For the other way around, stripped coconut species, which are more in, in immune related and trigger inflammation, and then you found it's associated, it's also positive association with your high and protein intake, animal and food intake, and uh, negatively associated with plant. So actually, it's also think maybe is the way you can have a good health and, and lifestyle, like a good diet, and then at a better um, and, Gut microbiome, therefore, uh, to be more uh, anti inflammatory um, bacteria to help him. So, to conclude, I think uh, we show that the host microbe interactions immunity are multi uh, phase stable. So there's one way, of course, bacteria can uh, trigger some inflammation. On the other way, and um, they also can be used actually to treat some diseases, particularly even for the um, um, activate some immune response to against uh, um, for the for the cancer treatment. And of course, there are still many things we still want to know. And that was also mentioned by Doctor at the beginning. Nowadays, we also engage and. Uh, uh, you know, organ on a cheap technology, able to mimic uh, and get also gut on a cheap and liver on a cheap, and also had the live bacteria collected for all my our participants, then try to in virtually to verify and, and their functionality. At the last, I also like to thank uh, Groningen Microbiome Center, which is actually multidisciplinary and interdepartment center involved many different PIs, different a large group of PhD and the postdocs, and with very diverse uh, uh, expertise background uh, from uh, from gastroenterology, hepatology, bioinformatics to uh, bacteria cultronomics and also uh, biology. And thank you, I'm happy to take some questions.